I've been in oncology long enough that I feel confident in saying immunotherapy has been one of the highlights, one of the breakthroughs, I think, that we have seen in the past, you know, 15 plus years. We all know those family members. Well, I have a friend that took this medicine and this is what they said. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) As oncology nurses, boy, do we need to do our due diligence and make sure that we are as educated on these drugs, these types of potential toxicities as possible as we continue to walk this journey with our patients. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Jardine, Oncology Clinical Specialist at ONS. And today we are joined by ONS member Christy Orba, nurse practitioner for Community Hospital Oncology Physicians in Indianapolis, Indiana, and member of the Central Indiana ONS chapter to discuss patient education prior to and during immunotherapy. This is a continued conversation from a previous episode that discussed findings from an ONS focus group Christy facilitated. We've linked that in the episode notes. This podcast episode is supported by an educational grant from AstraZeneca. ONS is solely responsible for the criteria, objectives, content, quality, and scientific integrity of its programs and publications. Thanks for joining me today, Christy. Thank you. So to start us off, let's review some of the gaps in patient education as they prepare for and begin immunotherapy. What are some of the things that the focus groups found? It was interesting that the focus group noticed that there were gaps, not only in the education that the patient needed, but also education that the oncology nurse needed. Specifically, maybe some of the newer oncology nurses that didn't have the experience yet with immuno-oncology. We know that the side effects are very, very different, and we have to really change our mindset and, and quite frankly, change how we evaluate and assess the patient each time they come in. So it was found that, that first of all, we needed to develop different types of evaluation tools, and also different types of educational tools. So oncology nurses could feel very confident and empowered in their assessment skills of assessing chemotherapy toxicities versus immunotherapy toxicities. And then as far as the gaps with patients, if a patient has already had chemo, they're going to come in with a very different mindset because they've experienced different toxicities. And what's interesting about the differences in those toxicities, right, is if I was getting ready to start on, let's just say I have breast cancer and someone's going to start me on adriamycin and cytoxin, almost to a dime, the oncology nurse can tell me when my counts are going to drop, when I might develop mouth sores, when my hair might start to fall out, when my urine might have a pink tinge to it from the adriamycin dye, almost to the minute they can tell me those things. So our toxicities with chemotherapy are oftentimes predictable, and that makes the education to the patient a bit easier, right? We tell them, here's when this is most likely going to happen. Here's when this is going to happen. When we're talking about immunotherapy, that's not the case. We have patients that go through immunotherapy and, quite frankly, really never have the first toxicity. Then we have other patients that have multiple toxicities, and they can occur at different times. We even have toxicities that can occur after the patient has completed 
their immunotherapy. So those were kind of the uh, the major gaps that we really tried to focus on. Those are really important pieces that they pulled out. And in thinking about, you know, our listeners that we have for the podcast, you know, there are a lot of nurses who are new to oncology, maybe just starting their career in nursing, who, you know, listen to get that kind of information um, from us. And thinking about those couple of things that you said, you know, about the side effect management and how to tell your patients what to expect. It's so overwhelming for patients when they're they have their diagnosis. Now they're sitting down being told what treatments that they're going to be having. So everything can be so overwhelming for them from, you know, talking about why they're getting this drug to what the adverse events are and when to expect this, who can be around you, all of those different things. How do you recommend that this information be presented to patients as they start their therapies? At our particular clinic, we have a patient education session. So the patient comes in and they're allowed to bring a support person. You know, four ears are always better than two, right? And they sit down with an oncology nurse and they're given a binder that includes all of the major toxicities that we'll be watching for. But I think here's the key is that education can't stop there. Because each time that patient comes in, we need to review those types of things. Now, maybe not to the extent that we did in the the hour-long session, right? But I don't know about you. When I see my primary care physician and she goes over things with me, a month later, I may be a little foggy with uh, what all she said. So Our patients are probably the same way, and especially at the outset of diagnosis or anytime we have to switch therapies, there's that overwhelming feeling that those patients have, and they can only absorb X amount. So I think it's really important each time they come in for their treatment to review, you know, a thumbnail review of, are you having any shortness of breath? Do you notice a cough when you go up and down stairs? Have there been any changes in your bowels? What's your fatigue level? You know, I think we have to go over those every single time to help patients help us diagnose or assess those toxicities early on. As you are well aware, Stephanie, immunotherapy toxicities can be sneaky they can actually come on very, very vaguely. And that's when we want to get them, right? We want to identify any of those toxicities when they're a grade one. We don't want to miss those early signs, those vague little sneaky symptoms, and then it accelerate and suddenly we have a grade three toxicity and we're having to hold therapy and and start high-dose steroids. We don't want it to get to that stage, if at all possible. You're right. I like how you put that, that they're sneaky because, you know, like you mentioned, you know, in our first question that we are so used to the side effects that go along with chemotherapy. We've been dealing with those for years. And so it's almost rote, you know, kind of how you said, we can almost tell people to the minute when they're going to experience those kinds of things. But with immunotherapy, you know, there are new medications and there's so many of them coming out so frequently and just new therapy options that it's just hard for us to remember and to know what all those symptoms might be. It could be something completely different. And you also mentioned earlier, one patient may have no symptoms at all. And then the next patient that you see has everything that could possibly happen with an immunotherapy. So it's just that unknown of how people are going to react and how their body is going to react to these treatments. So I like how you said just, you know, that, every time you need to come in 
and let's just do a review and make sure that something hasn't come up that maybe the patient didn't even think about or didn't remember from that first teaching session that you had with them. In oncology, we work as a care team a lot of times and have, you know, there's different disciplines that we all work together to take care of our patients. So how does the education that's provided to the patients by different members of the care team differ? How do how does that work? And is there any reason that somebody should adjust the way that they're teaching a patient? Oh, we should always adjust the way that we're teaching a patient. We need to make the education specific for that patient. One of the doctors I work with does a really neat thing. And he always asks the patient what they do for a living or what they have done for a living. And the reason why he does that is that helps him use analogies that the patient is very familiar with. And if we don't know our patient and understand their background and the knowledge base they're bringing, there's no way we can, as oncology nurses or an oncology team, provide proper education for that patient. For example, I have a patient right now that I'm treating for breast cancer, and she's a biology professor at a local college. What she needs to know and how she's going to understand the information is very different than someone, I I have a, a sixth grade school teacher, and boy, is she intelligent and very body centered and But my education to her is different because she comes to us with a different understanding. The other thing is we need to understand if we're sending home written materials, you know, that needs to be at a lower reading age. What is it, the average reading grade level reading for folks in the United States is right about sixth or seventh grade level. And so we need to make sure that when we are supplementing our education that we give patients and we're sending home written materials that needs to be written materials that they can understand so it can truly supplement. At our particular clinic, like I said, the nurses will do the education for the IV treatments. We're very, very blessed and work with a really strong pharmacy team and they do all of the teaching for the oral medications. And Teaching styles between different team members are different, right? The the pharmacy team has different teaching styles perhaps than the nursing team. And it's complementary of each other, I believe. And then, of course, when they see the provider, the provider may add other, other suggestions and educational pieces that would be important. I love that example that you gave by asking what their job is and how you can use that and relate to, you know, give examples. That's, that's a fabulous idea. (laughs) Thank you for that one. Well, he's much more skilled at it than I am. Let me assure you, (laughs) because every once in a while, yesterday we were starting a brand new patient and he is an airplane mechanic. And I was like, oh dear. (laughs) Short of knowing you get peanuts on airplanes, I was lost. I would be too. I agree with you. But it definitely is a great thought to, you know, kind of consider. And probably, you know, like you said, just considering how they process information, you know, based on the type of jobs that they work in and things like that. But that's a really, really good thing to consider when you're starting to make your plan for educating patients. You mentioned earlier about when you have your teaching appointment, let's say, with the patient prior to them starting that you allow them to bring in someone else with them. Four years or better than two. So how can nurses make sure that they are including, you know, the patient's family members or their caregivers in the education discussion? What are some important things about that? 
first of all, if they're allowed to come into the meeting, that's very, very helpful. And nothing makes me any happier than to walk in that meeting and see that support person with a, a notebook and pen. And, and you just know that, that they're ready to really be a support person. Of course, let's just kind of talk about the elephant in the room, right? COVID has kind of changed some of that. We went through a period of time where no one was allowed in our building except the patient. And so we've had to get creative during that time, right? And use FaceTime and and allow patients to record what is said. That's, That's another thing that I think is a really good idea. Boy, aren't we a society that walks around with our smartphones in our hand And almost all of those smartphones have a a recorder on there. And we encourage patients when we're doing our patient teaching. We also encourage it when we're doing the initial consultation to record what's being said. So then they can listen to that over and over and over again. Because, you know, occasionally we've had support people that have said, now, you know, I heard you say X, Y, Z, and the patient is like, no, 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 that's not what was said. And so if they have that recording and they can go back and listen to it, that's helpful. That's also where that supplemental written material is helpful as well, because they can really go back and document, okay, yes, it does say when the counts are low, take your temperature, you know, every eight hours or, or whatever, whatever the example might be. That's a really good point. And you're right. We definitely have had to kind of be creative in how we get that information to our patients, family members, and caregivers. And it's so important. And to have them be able to record that, like you said, how many times do they have family members that weren't there that are asking the question and wanting to know, well, what did they say? What you know, should you be doing? Or what is that medicine that you're going to be taking? Because we all know those family members, well, I have a friend that took this medicine and this is what they said. Amen. <laughs> yeah. So it's really great if they have that to fall back on, you know, so that they know and they're comfortable with the treatment that they're getting. And you know, what they've been told and encouraged to do. So I really like that idea. So now let's talk a little bit about the treatment that they're given. And so many times our patients are given combination therapy. So, you know, whether that's chemotherapy and surgery or immunotherapy and chemotherapy, what kind of education is needed in those situations? Boy, that really complicates things, doesn't it? When we have multimodality treatments that the patient is receiving, maybe they're receiving radiation as well and chemo and and, uh, immunotherapy, that really makes an oncology nurse be at the top of her game to assess those, those toxicities. I think we need to take a step back, though, and talk about before we ever start that therapy we have to have baseline on those patients, right? We need to know baseline, what are their bowel habits? Baseline, what is their pulmonary status? You know, do they come to us with emphysema? Do they come to us with significant asthma? All those baselines are very important because if we don't know a baseline, when that patient comes in, it doesn't really matter what therapy they're on. If we don't understand the baseline, we don't understand if there's a change from that baseline. So I think that's the most important thing. Then we really need to develop a differential diagnosis, just like we learned in nursing school, right? So a patient comes in, let's say that they're receiving chemotherapy as well as immunotherapy. And they come in and they have diarrhea. So we really need to walk through that. Is that from their chemotherapy? Could that be from their immunotherapy? Has anyone else in their house had diarrhea? Could it be a bug? You know, could they have a GI virus going on? Were they at the local fair and tried every greasy fried food that there was at the food trucks? You know, all of that is very, very important 
in the assessment. The other thing too is we need to make our best judgment on what we think is causing that toxicity and make our very best intervention. But if the symptom doesn't turn around rapidly, we need to consider the other items that were on our differential diagnosis and be prepared to change the intervention that, that we're providing to the patient for their, for their toxicity. Thank you. That's great too. So many things to remember <laughs> and to consider. You know, we think about what we have to know, you know, and how overwhelming that can be at times. And I think it's just a good way for us to really think about how can we make sure that this education for our patients and their, you know, family members, caregivers can be done in a way that, you know, to reduce that anxiety and overwhelming feeling for them as well. So another thing is with immunotherapy, you know, there's a lot of testing that needs to be done with patients. What kinds of things could you educate patients about with the routine studies that have to be done? The studies that we're going to follow are basically twofold, right? We're going to follow laboratory values. And again, that baseline is important, right? We need to know those baseline liver functions, those baseline renal functions, What's their baseline TSH? All of that is really important. So then when the patient comes in and we're reevaluating those values, we know if there's a change, for example, in the liver functions, then are we concerned that perhaps the patient is developing an immune-related hepatitis? Those laboratory values are one piece of the evaluation The other piece of the evaluation is going to be scanning. The scanning, whether it's a PET scan, whether it's a CAT scan, whether it's MRIs, but we will be scanning those patients on a regular basis to assess and evaluate the treatment response, right? So if a patient is is stable and doesn't have a lot of symptoms, it's not unusual that you'll scan them every 12 weeks. If you have a patient that has a lot of symptoms, great deal of tumor burden, you're very concerned about that tumor getting away from you, that disease getting away from you, that might be a patient that's scanned as as frequently as eight weeks. So it, it depends on the patient, depends on the situation. And of course, different diseases are going to require different scanning. Christy, something that can be unique with patients who are receiving immunotherapy is something called pseudoprogression on CT imaging. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. With chemo, we never saw that. And that's been a new thing we've, we've had to learn about and evaluate and assess for. Pseudoprogression isn't very common. I think statistically, we see it less than 10% in patients. But for example, let's say I have a lung cancer, okay? I have a lung cancer and you're treating me with some sort of regimen that includes immunotherapy. And you do my first scanning and it almost looks as if my disease has gotten bigger. But when you assess me, my pain is better, energy levels better, I'm breathing better, you know, the patient's better, but the scan isn't. That's when we start thinking about pseudoprogression. And what happens is we actually believe that you can see the T cells surrounding or the immune response surrounding that tumor. And it can actually look bigger when what we're seeing is the inflammation, the irritation, the attack, if you will, of the immune system on that tumor. You know, it would be highly unusual and unheard of if you saw pseudo progression a year down the road. When we see it is usually with that first scan or two. And early on, I think it wasn't unusual for us to jump ship. You know, we thought, oh boy, that this treatment is not working. But that's why it's important to remember when we're assessing a patient, it's not just one thing that we're using as an assessment tool. 
Yes, the scans are important. Yes, the laboratory values are important. But that physical assessment and listening to that patient to see how they feel is very, very important. I had this happen not long ago with a gentleman that had small cell lung cancer, and we were treating him. And he came back in at his scans at 12 weeks, and he was not the same man that walked into our office 12 weeks prior. He was uh, had a much better collar, had no dyspnea, was out playing golf again, was off his pain medicine, but his scan looked worse. And that just did not make sense. And so we did not abort therapy. We continued therapy and rescanned him again. And then we saw the result. Then we saw the improvement of the disease. So that's kind of how we think of pseudoprogression. That's very interesting and something that's so important to know. And even, you know, just like you said, you know, what we've learned from the first time those kinds of things started showing up and like you said, jumped ship and then realized, hey, this might be something that we need to just continue through and watch and then, you know, see that good results from the therapy. So that's super interesting. And something important for folks to realize and understand. So the focus group talked about, and you mentioned a little bit earlier, how immuno-oncology, you know, immunotherapy can present different, the toxicities can present differently than other therapies, even showing up months or years later. So how can oncology nurses educate patients on what to watch for and report? Because you know, the patients are thinking, hey, I am done with therapy. Thank goodness this is all over and I'm going moving forward. How can nurses educate patients in that area? Again, I think it's one of those things that we talk to them about each time we see them. And especially once they hit follow up, we're continuing to watch for these types of toxicities. We want you to continue to monitor your bowel habits, your pulmonary status, your fatigue level. And if any of that changes, even if you're off therapy, we absolutely need to know. We saw a really neat educational piece, or I guess I should really call it assessment piece that I thought was really helpful. Now, it was it was a piece from a pharmaceutical company. And it was the outline of a patient, and it started at the head and went all the way to the feet, and it listed symptoms that needed to be reported to your healthcare provider, starting at, as I said, the top of the head. And were there any mental changes? Were there any changes in hair quality? Were there headaches? fatigue, those kinds of things. And, you know, all the way down and really included all of the systems. And what one of the nurses in the focus group shared with us, how they utilized that piece is they encouraged patients to tape it to their bathroom mirror. So they were continually reminded of those vague symptoms that would need to be reported to their healthcare provider. That is a really good thing. And I think visuals are so important and so helpful, you know, to patients when they're trying to remember, again, like I said, remember all the things that they need to, you know, think about and tell their healthcare providers. Something else that you mentioned early on that came out of the focus group was the need for a universal method of tracking the immune-related adverse events. So the group discussed some methods for patients to record that. What resources are are available for patients in when you educate them on recording, you know, other than, you know, kind of like you said, you just gave that example of the outline of the patient, but are there any other resources that patients can use? Yes, several of the uh, pharmaceutical companies and, quite frankly, a couple of the gals in the focus group that aren't allowed to use branded products or branded pieces of education have actually come up with 
checklist that they send the patient home with that they're to, you know, keep track of. And then they bring that with them each time to their their appointment so those symptoms can be reviewed. And I thought that was a really neat idea. We don't do that at my institution, but boy, that that would be helpful. The other thing that we discussed really wasn't around patient reporting, but where in that electronic medical record are the nurses recording the patient reported toxicities? Where are the providers recording it? And is there a place in that electronic record where everyone will go and look at to evaluate those symptoms? You know, is there just one universal page that the pharmacy can go to to look at that the the provider, the oncology nurse, the medical assistant that checks the patient in? Is there that one universal spot? And unfortunately, not many folks on the focus group have that at their institution. And and I'm one of those. I I mean, I think it's good to know that that was identified, that there is that need, but it's sad also that there isn't very much out there. So did the group talk about what would be the next steps in the tools that can be developed or need to be developed and how that might work? They sure did. They were just a a dynamic group. I think someone needs to hire them <laughs> monthly. They they just came up with so many good ideas. They really felt like the education again needed to be twofold, that there needed to be education geared at the patient. Like I said, assessment tools that the patient would bring in that that they might have kept track of any symptoms that they might have. Another gal in the group said they actually give those tools when the patient is sitting in the chair. So the patient fills that out right then. But certainly some sort of universal patient assessment tool that the oncology nurse or the provider can review each time they see that patient. And then more of a universal tool that the healthcare provider uses, you know, that the the oncology nurse looks at, that the provider looks at, that the pharmacy looks at. So we're all kind of focusing on the same things and how that might look. I think the focus group felt like in the world in which we live, coming up with something on the healthcare side that really fit in each and every electronic record was probably ideal. Uh, Whether that's feasible or not, in some places that will probably be much more feasible than others, but they felt like that was really, would be the ultimate tool if we could develop it. And then, like I said earlier, about the patient and, and something they would feel fill out consistently. So we can look at that over time, because if we're looking at those symptoms over time, I think that we will be better able to identify, as you and I have said, those sneaky little symptoms before they erupt into something more serious. Yeah. And I think, too, you know, being able to look at multiple patients symptoms over time, that's going to help us to learn and understand the nuances with these new therapies as well. And, you know, we'll be better able to teach new patients and different patients, you know, about this and reassure them that everybody isn't the same, but we've seen a lot of different, you know, ways that these kind of side effects and reactions happen. So, we're here to help you and and just know that it's the most important thing is letting us know so that we can do what is best and try to address those things right away. You know, I've been in oncology long enough that I feel confident in saying immunotherapy has been one of the highlights, one of the breakthroughs I think that we have seen in the past, you know, 15 plus years. And the good news is it's not going anywhere. 
we're going to see more and more of it. And, and with that said, more and more patients are going to be, have access to these drugs and be able to benefit from them. So as oncology nurses, boy, do we need to do our due diligence and make sure that we are as educated on these drugs, these types of potential toxicities as possible as we continue to walk this journey with our patients. Right. I agree with you. So you mentioned, you know, how important it is for us as oncology nurses to understand this and know this. And we've talked about educating the patients and family members. Now let's talk a little bit about the other healthcare team members that our patients encounter, whether that is in the emergency department or their primary care physicians. And, you know, we talked about long-term side effects. How can we help those other care team members understand what some of these side effects and long-term things that our patients might come up with, might end up having, so that they're better prepared as well when our patients are receiving these therapies? You bring up a really good point. We like to think that we all just live in our little oncology bubble, but we need the entire healthcare team to be on board in watching for and potentially managing these toxicities, don't we? One thing that I think is very helpful is once a patient is done with therapy, having that survivorship care plan that goes back to the primary care doctor that lists every single treatment that the patient has had, including chemotherapy, immunotherapy, surgical procedures, uh, radiation. And then with that in mind, what long-term toxicities are most commonly seen? Because you're right, at some point, patients will be released from our clinic, right? If they've been cured, if they've had no disease recurrence. Actually, yesterday in clinic, I Two patients that I saw graduated, they were over 10 years out, no disease, had completed treatment. And so it's really important then going back to their PCP that they know those really important things to watch for. So those survivorship care plans are important. If you don't have survivorship care plans, simply picking up the phone or sending an email to that PCP, hey, this patient has had chest radiation. We need to make sure they're getting frequent mammograms because chest radiation can put them at higher risk for developing breast cancer down the line, can also put them at higher risk for some cardiovascular issues. So making sure they know that. If they've had pelvic radiation, making sure their OBGYN knows that. If they end up in the emergency room, you you mentioned that early on, if they end up in the emergency room, we really need to do our due diligence if we send them to the emergency room to make sure we're picking up that phone and sharing with those folks our concerns. Hey, this person's on immunotherapy. They've got acute shortness of breath. This could be immune-induced pneumonitis. Yes, it could be a PE. Yes, it could be various others. But we need to share as much information as we have with our other health care team So they can be educated and they can help us better care for the patient. The other thing, if you're sending patients in for scans and, you know, you're concerned about pseudoprogression or you're concerned about immune-related pneumonitis or you're concerned about immune-related colitis, that needs to be on the requisition. Let that radiologist know that that's something you're looking for. So they're making sure they're, they're really pulling out that magnifying glass and really looking at those types of differences that they might see on a scan or on a film. So sharing our information is very important. That is really good to know and so important because our patients do end up seeing, you know, so many different members of the healthcare team and just so that everyone is aware and knows you know, what to expect and what those, you know, little nuances or sneaky things that sneak up on our patients might be. Christy, this has been, you know, such a great, great discussion. And 
I just appreciate you being on with me today and talking about the things that the focus group found and where those needs are for our nurses to be able to better care for our patients who are receiving immunotherapy. As we are finishing up today, I just have some quick fire questions I want to ask you right here at the end. So I have about three or four more little questions I want to ask just real quick. So Christy, what's something about immunotherapy patient education that's not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? It needs to look different than our education that we do for chemotherapy. There are different toxicities that we see with immunotherapy. We can see toxicities later on down the line. And I think that's probably one of the most important things we need to keep in mind. Love that answer. Next, what additional training or education do oncology nurses need to develop solutions for immunotherapy patient education? We need to make sure the new oncology nurses know about immunotherapy and are are aware of some of those different toxicities. What are some additional resources for patient and providers? It's important when we're looking for resources that we look to really good, reputable sites. So looking at places like ASCO, like ONS, both of those have some really good Provider education pieces. ONS has some really good programs out there that will help educate the oncology nurses. The American Cancer Society has good educational tools, especially to use with our oncology patients. And then there's the NCCN that really provides guidelines in walking through various toxicities and appropriate treatments for those toxicities. Okay. And do you have any final comments for us today? The focus group was a group of dynamic folks that had wonderful ideas. It's so empowering and encouraging to hear oncology nurses from all over the United States with very different roles, but one main goal, and that is to take excellent care of their oncology patient. And I just found that very, very rewarding to spend that three hours with those folks and hear the dedication that each and every one of them had to their profession, but more importantly, to the patients for which they cared. Christy, thank you so much for joining me today. It has been really enlightening, these couple podcasts that we did and talking about the focus group, and I have just really enjoyed our conversation. So thanks for joining me. Oh, I've had a great time, Stephanie. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part of this episode by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you downloaded your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guests and not necessarily ONS.